I want to welcome you to Austin Heights Baptist Church this 24th Sunday after Pentecost. Will you join me in the greeting? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up into the Lord. Now I invite you to stand. Go to one another with these ancient words of encouragement. The Lord be with you. Okay. Y'all are making your way back to your seats. Now, on the, if you're seated on the outside, seat pocket in front of you has a little notebook. It's the way we have, keep up with contact information and update that. I invite you to record your attendance and others on your row. Pass it down to them, please. And meanwhile, there's some announcements. Uh, Christina, anything about youth that you want to announce? Yeah, 3.30 to 6 is Sunday school here, but I'm coming here at our normal church. We meet where? Here. Meet here at the church. Okay. Vic, choir practice at 6. Okay, very good. Okay. Yeah, as y'all can see, we like to plan far ahead when we're back. So, yeah, anything else? Anything else? Okay, all right, keep going. All right, Judy. It's hard to believe that it's already time to start thinking about Advent, but it's coming up. So on November 29th, that's a Wednesday evening, we will have a hanging of the greens. Um, 6.30, we will hang the garland and trim the Christmas tree and put the Advent pyramids out. But like trimming your tree at home and decorating, it's more fun to do it with the whole family. So we would like for the whole church family to come. We will have refreshments afterward, probably kind of traditional, maybe like some hot chocolate and Christmas cookies. So we hope everybody will be there 6.30 Wednesday, November 29th. Thank you, Judy. You're not partial to hot chocolate and Christmas cookies, are you? So, okay. Other announcements we need to know about? Let me say a, um, a word of thanks to all of you who worked in various ways for this weekend of the, yes, last night's community-wide Thanksgiving service and supper, preparing uh, turkeys, delivering them, cutting them up, uh, and, and going out in the community. It was a major effort 
Um, and if you have any uh, evaluations that you would like to share about your experiences or ways we can improve, please let me know because I have a Ministerial Alliance meeting tomorrow at noon and we'll be uh, discussing do we keep doing it on Saturday? Do we go back to the old way of doing it on a Monday? Uh, and so on. And if you've got input, I'd be glad to hear it after the service. But I do want to say clearly thank you for all of your help. A lot of it was done on short notice, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to be involved. Okay, 24th Sunday after Pentecost, and Judy mentioned that uh, it's, it's sort of early to already be talking about Advent, but the truth of the matter is that every Sunday after All Saints Sunday, which was last week, we began to move into Advent themes, preparation, getting ready. The scriptures uh, from now until Advent are in Matthew chapter 25. Today, parable of uh, the Ten bridesmaids, uh, parable of the talents is after that, parable of the final judgment and the sheep and the goats. All of these are about preparing ourselves, being ready, uh, looking at ultimate questions. Uh, these are all Advent themes. So even though Advent starts December 3rd, we start talking about this stuff now. So let's take a deep breath, breathe out all the distractions. And this morning, as we breathe in, let's pray that the Holy Spirit refills our oil in our lamps. Let us worship God.
please join me in the call to worship. Come, children of God, gather to worship the risen Christ. Let us come to the light of his salvation. God is light, and in God is no darkness at all. Let the light of God dispel our darkness and bring us out of the shadows. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have communion with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. God is light, and in God is no darkness at all. May the light of Christ shine and rule us today. Thank you for bringing us together as we prepare for a long night of waiting. Help fill our lamps as we wait for you, Lord. <coughs> Give us the courage to witness your presence in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We invite the children to come up to the front and join Aunt Judy. But in this time, the maidens, the young women, were uh, maids for the groom. And what they did when it was time to go to the wedding feast, they would light the groom's path to the feast. So they had to be ready to do that. And we're going to find out about these ten brides or groom maids. <laughs> Once there were ten maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of the maidens were wise, and five of the maidens were foolish. The wise maidens brought flasks of oil along with their lamps. <coughs> now it happened that the bridegroom was late in coming. So the maidens sat down to wait, and they fell asleep. At midnight, a cry was heard, Behold the bridegroom! Come to meet him! 
Well, the five foolish maidens said, Oh, the flames of our lamps are dying. We are running out of oil. They said to the five wise maidens, Give us some of your oil. The wise maidens said, No, there is not enough for all of us. You had better go and buy some more oil for yourselves. And away the five foolish maidens ran. But while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived, and the five wise maidens were ready. And they went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. The five foolish maidens came back and found the door to the wedding feast closed. My Lord, they called, open the door to us. But he replied, truly, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. What did those five foolish maidens learn? They ran out of oil, didn't they? What did they learn? I think they learned two things. First, there was a celebration that they were waiting for. Did they get to go to the celebration? No, they didn't because they weren't ready. Then they had a job to do, didn't they? They were supposed to light the way for the bridegroom to go to the feast, but they weren't ready for that either. So I think the five maids learned, be ready when it's time to do your job and be ready when it's time to celebrate and play. Let's say a prayer. <clears throat> Loving God, help us be ready to work when there is work you would have us to do. But also let us be ready to have fun when it's time to celebrate. Thank you that we have our church family to work with and to celebrate with. Amen. Amen. And you guys are going to go back with Miss Christina and Miss Rachel to Children's Church. Now, as the children are making their way to the back, our ushers are coming forward. They have prayer cards. These cards are for folks on our prayer list on the very back page or others you know who might need a note of encouragement telling them that we are praying for them and uh, want to encourage them and give them hope. So raise your hand. Ushers will be glad to pass as many cards as you need. The car, there are more cards available in the hallway after the service on the small table. As you look over the list, let me mention a couple of things. Uh,
join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, hear our prayers this morning. Well, God, we pray you come to us this morning, refilling our hearts and souls with your spirit. We confess that often we burn the midnight oil on our various projects or because we worry into the night or because we despair or we're overwhelmed with grief and suffering. We are distracted with all our other activities and we end up trying to be renewed by spiritual junk food. So God of joy and God of hope, come and fill our emptiness with your body, your holy oil of renewal and healing. We pray for each other and for others we know living on the edge of emptiness. Help us so we might help others. Through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin first in silence. Please join me in the corporate confession. O oh God, we confess that sometimes our faith is stale and flat. We rush frantically through our days and then realize we've missed the heart and content we should have been with us. So in, in this place, please come and meet with us. Amen. Hear the assurance of pardon. The good news is that Jesus Christ forgives, forgives us and gives us a way to begin again.
scripture lesson is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. <coughs> As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bride, bride ma- bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, choir. You can't see this, but a little secret. I like to watch Vic when she's directing, and when it's over with, there's this, and it goes well like that, there's this slight smile. <laughs> she looks, <laughs> choir, she was smiling, so y'all need to know that. But, uh, let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, as we've said this morning, we began in chapter 25 of Matthew, the parable of the ten wise and foolish bridesmaids. The chapter also contains the parable of the talents, then the parable of the sheep and the goats. These are three big parables, important Three parables about preparing and being ready because the day of the Lord is coming. And in a way, in a sense, we're already beginning to step into Advent themes. New Testament professor at the Perkins School of Theology at SMU, Alice McKenzie, said that uh, some years ago she was teaching a year-long spirituality class with about a dozen students committed to the practices of Christian prayer. Over the Christmas break, each student committed to read a book, uh, a particular book of the Bible prayerfully from beginning to end. One of the students, a young man, told after Christmas break when he came back and wrote his paper that his wife had gone to visit her parents right after Christmas and was going to be gone for a couple of weeks. That left him home in their apartment with their puppy, a beagle named Sadie. Every night around 10 o'clock, he said, he would sit on the love seat in a particular place and spend at least half an hour on his devotional reading. And Sadie would hop up on the love seat, sit beside him, and then soon she began to put her head in his lap. One night, he said he got caught up in watching the news, didn't go to the love seat at the prescribed time of 10 o'clock, <laughs> said he came over and began to pull at his pants legs. <laughs> Another night, he said he was exhausted, went to bed at 945. Just as he was drifting off to sleep, he heard a whimpering and felt the blanket being pulled off the bed. <laughs> he looked over the side of the bed, and there was Sadie his bedspread in her teeth, calling the him to prayer. He decided that some dogs were bird dogs, some dogs were sheep dogs, but Sadie was a prayer dog. <laughs> Professor McKenzie says this parable of the ten bridesmaids is a prayer dog parable. It reminds us some things are so important and essential that we need to tend to them instead of being distracted. Now, Matthew's community of faith, small church, could not afford to be distracted. They were a small, struggling congregation surrounded by an antagonistic society. Now, not too many years before, the surrounding society was mostly oblivious to this tiny enclave of Christ followers. But in recent years, things had started turning ugly. A lot of those whom Matthew was, to whom Matthew was writing were former Jews who had been excommunicated from the synagogue, abandoned by their families on top of facing the imminent threat of a hostile empire, and they sort of felt themselves being in between, in limbo. They didn't want to give up being Jewish, but the synagogue wouldn't have anything to do with them. They're part of this new little community of faith in Christ, but what had been benevolent or neutral toward all of these folks could no longer be taken for granted. They couldn't make assumptions about the wider supporting structures. These believers were struggling just to survive in that dark time, so there was an urgency to come together, stick together, reconnect in a community of faith that can endure. 
So Matthew remembers these parables of Jesus and he writes them down to this little church to see and help this little congregation make it. And not just make it, but to make it as faithful followers of Christ. So Jesus says, the news goes out that the bridegroom is coming, so the ten bridesmaids need to get ready for the traditional big party that evening. All ten get their lamps ready, fill them with oil, head out to meet the bridegroom. Five wise bridesmaids take extra oil, while five foolish bride bridesmaids do not. All ten arrive at the wedding venue excited that the bridegroom is coming, except the bridegroom doesn't show up. They wait and wait. A message arrives saying that bridegroom's going to be late. It's going to be delayed. He's coming, but it's going to take a while. So they wait and wait some more, and eventually they get tired of waiting and start dozing off, and soon all ten drift off to sleep. Late, around midnight, the herald beats on the door shouting, The bridegroom is showing up. He's coming. Come on, everybody. Let's come out to meet him. I know it's late, but trim the wicks. Relight your lamps. Light the way. It's party time. The problem is that only five of the bridesmaids have enough oil with them to keep their lamps lit, while the other five are running low and burning out. They try to borrow oil from the wise bridesmaids, but they can't, so the foolish bridesmaids, bridesmaids frantically rush out looking for a 24-7 convenience store that carries lamp oil. Meanwhile, everybody goes into the big party, shuts the door. The groom refuses to open up even when the five return with their lamps burning, and they're yelling, Lord, Lord, but the door remains slammed in their face with the unexpected, terse, and emphatic, I don't know you. And the parable concludes with these words, be alert, be ready, for you have no idea when the bridegroom will return. Now, part of why I refer to this as an Advent parable is this closing admonition, keep watch, keep awake, be ready. These are primary Advent themes. In verse 10, it says that while the five foolish and unprepared bridesmaids rushed out to find some more oil, the bridegroom arrived and those who were ready went in with him. Which begs the question, ready for what? Now, all ten were ready for the bridegroom. All were watching and eagerly waiting. At the same time, all ten drifted off to sleep. No one can be perpetually alert, standing on tiptoes, looking out the window all the time. Sooner or later, everyone gets tired. Everyone drifts off to sleep sooner or later. What makes the five bridesmaids wise and distinctive is not because they were ready for the groom, but because they were ready for the groom's delay. To bring along an extra flask of oil means they were ready for the bridegroom. To, if he showed up early or if he showed up late, they were prepared. If he showed up early, all ten were ready and would have gone into the banquet. But the bridegroom, like Christ and the kingdom, did not arrive promptly. He was delayed. For Matthew's struggling and exhausted church, he was delayed. Furthermore, for some 2,000 years, he's still delayed. The wise ones in the church are those who were prepared for the delay, those who hold on to their faith deep into the night. And even though they see no bridegroom coming, they still serve, they still hope, and they still pray, and they still wait for the promised return for the kingdom of God and the bridegroom. I read of a seminary professor who brings an old-fashioned oil lamp to her class on the spiritual life every semester. It's the kind of lamp with a wick and real oil in the bottom. She talks with the class about the role of the pastor, the role of the Christian, the role of the church, all to be a light in this world, the light of the world. Somewhere during the lecture and discussion, 
she lights the wick while they continue to talk and the lamp starts burning. Now before class, when she put oil in the lamp, she only put a very small amount of oil, so in a few minutes, the lamp burns out. Then she asks the students, uh, what happens when the oil burns out? Well, when the lamp goes out in class, it seems that all the lights came on with the students and they are engaged in a vigorous conversation. Someone says, well, when the oil runs out, you have nothing to give. Someone else often says, well, you have burnout. <laughs> Most everyone chimes in, and a burned out pastor or one with no oil or a Christian with no oil or a church with no oil cannot be the light of the world for anybody, no matter how much you want to. Which raises another question for all of us. What fills us spiritually when we run dry? What's in our lamps? What replenishes our oil? Where do we find God in the middle of the long, dark night? How can we make sure that we get enough oil for our lamps? And because and we all know this, you know sooner or later you're going to run dry. And when we do, we cannot be a light for anybody. A friend of mine who's a pastor and preacher told me years ago her teenage son walked into the room, it was in the, near the kitchen, about 5.30 in the afternoon, and said, what's for dinner? And she said, meatloaf. And the teenager's son said, what, again? And my friend said at that point, she lost it and suddenly turned into Godzilla right there in the kitchen. <laughs> Her teenager son stood there, let her rant, and when she had finished, he calmly looked at her and said, let me guess, you've run out of oil. <laughs> Those preacher's kids. <laughs> when the arrow on the gas tank points to empty, we're going to run out of gas. If a two-year-old doesn't get a nap, she's going to have a meltdown. When we haven't had a conversation with our spouse in three weeks that hasn't involved planning and scheduling logistics, if that's all we talk about, our marriage is going to be dry. If we have worked extended hours for longer than we care to know, our relationships are going to suffer. If we don't pay attention to exercise and what we eat for 30 years, our body is going to let us know if we do not tend to our oil, it will sooner or later catch up with us. Now, it's also true that there are some kinds of oil we can't borrow from someone else. Students learn this pretty quickly, or they better. You can borrow someone's homework or download an essay from the Internet, but sooner or later there will be the reckoning of the final exam and it'll be discovered whether you burnt the midnight oil, truly studying the material. There are some kinds of preparation we can only do for ourselves. There are some reserves that no one else can build up for us. We can't borrow someone else's peace of mind or their passion for God. We can't say to our friend, you have such a happy marriage, can you give me some of that? It doesn't work that way. We have to find it ourselves. We have to figure up, figure ourselves what fills us up spiritually, how do we get it, and make sure that we have enough to carry with us every day. And here's the thing. We will run out. Time will run out. The hour gets late. Everyone gets sleepy. We all doze. We all put it off saying, one of these days I'm going to quit working so hard and put in that quality time with my kids. One of these days I'm going to quit flitting around and get involved with God. We all doze. We all live distracted lives. We all put it off. And then the shout goes up. He's coming. It's time. The day is today. And we're caught unprepared. And we don't have our flask of oil. My old teacher in Atlanta, Dr. Craddock, I remember this story. He knew a woman, he said, whose entire spiritual life consisted of reading Hallmark cards. 
she rarely ever went to church, never really opened the Bible much, didn't spend much time in prayer, but she read Hallmark cards almost every day. They were quick. They were easy to digest. They were easily remembered, sort of like living on social uh, media memes today. Anyway, the day came when she was in the hospital diagnosed with terminal cancer. Dr. Craddock went by to see her. He remembered that on the table next to her was a stack of Hallmark cards three inches high. But as he said, there wasn't enough sustenance in that stack of cards to keep a bird alive. Yet that was all she had to get her through. The time will come when we have to draw on the oil we have right here in our flask. Good intentions and long-range plans will not suffice. One of these days kind of spirituality will not be enough. Reading spiritual junk food on social media won't help us survive. It must come from God today, not tomorrow. We have to start reaching down and refueling our lamps in the living God. Now, my guess is that of those five wise bridesmaids, more than one were prepared because they hung around the other bridesmaids, the other wise ones. Perhaps, perhaps there was only one with the maturity, the discipline, who planned ahead, but the other four had enough sense to hang out with her so her preparations rubbed off on her and they too learned how to prepare. Now, one reason we have the church, the community in Christ, is so we hang out with one another and learn good habits from each other, support one another, and hold each other accountable about, oh, remember, time to fill up with oil. And then finally, let's not forget the purpose of it all. These bridesmaids were ready not out of fear of being locked out, but because they were excited about getting to see the bridegroom and going to the wedding banquet. The Christian life and church are not about fear. It's not a fear-based religion. It's not a fear-based advent. The faith we have is not about fear. We keep our lamps filled because of joy, excitement. We fill our flask out of hope. The joy and hope in that kingdom of God in Christ is coming and all will be made right someday. Now, I've told this story, but I love this story. I'm going to tell it quickly again. Years ago, back when apartheid was the rule in South Africa, there had been a, a planned political rally against apartheid. It had been outlawed by the apartheid uh, government of South Africa. So instead, they organized a big worship service in the cathedral in Cape Town. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was preaching. Uh, the place was surrounded by police and military soldiers. They had armored cars outside, uh, police and armed soldiers everywhere. And inside the building, the church was packed with black folks, down and out folks, struggling and in despair. But along the walls of the sanctuary of the cathedral were police, and they, had, uh, they were armed, and they had video cameras, and they're videoing everybody who's sitting on all the different rows. Came time when a bishop, Archbishop Tutu rose to speak. Everybody was tense. They knew the cops were there. But then he, with his confidence, proclaimed that the evil and oppression of the system of apartheid cannot prevail and when he said that, most people in the room on both sides didn't really believe him. Tutu pointed his finger right at the police. They were recording him. And he said, you may be powerful, indeed very powerful, but you are not God. And the God whom we serve cannot be mocked. And you have already lost. Then they said that he came out from behind the pulpit flashed that famous smile of his and sort of softened a little bit. And he said, so since you've already lost, as we've already made clear, we are inviting you to come and join the winning side. And when he said that, that congregation in that cathedral erupted 
and I mean exploded with joy, laughter, and, it, and then they started singing, and everybody started dancing. And I mean, the place was coming apart. The cops didn't know what to do. Some of them just got out of the way. Some got in a corner. Some went outside. But the whole congregation of this massive cathedral started dancing and singing, dancing and shouted with joy, so much so that it spilled out into the streets, the front steps of the cathedral, where there were more people, there were more cops, but they didn't know what to do. And all of these massive crowds of people started singing and dancing and shouting. It was chaos. It was joy. It was hope. Now you hear me. Someday the bridegroom will come. And there is going to be a big banquet and a big party. According to Jesus, someday there will be a day when sor the sorrow of this world will be turned into dancing. There will be a day someday when justice will flow down like an ever flowing stream. Someday when the, there will be a day when the earth is made new. Someday there will be a day when hurt is changed into singing, when despair is lifted into shouting. There will be a day someday when every tear will be wiped away, when death shall be no more. There will be a day someday when mourning and crying and pain will be no more. There will be a day someday. So we sing and dance today. Today we are preparing our oil flask. We serve and pray today so our lamps will be lit. It's going to be something. It's going to be the party of all time. And you don't want to miss it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, Mother of us all. Amen. Let us pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, let us remember to walk in God's light. Let us also remember to be generous with our gifts of money and time to please you. Let our hearts be filled with love and let that love spill out into the world and show our Christian love to all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I ask you to remain standing. Open your hymn book to this great old hymn, number 478. In a moment when we sing this hymn, I will be here at the front to receive anyone who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, saying that you want to be a part of Austin Heights Baptist Church. We'll receive you as we sing. people said thank you for being here Ethan thank you for helping lead us in worship you did a great job hey and men y'all need to start wearing suits like this young all right let's take each other's hands for our benediction look who you're holding hands with and hold on tight because we're going to need each other this week now may God bless you and keep you May God's face shine upon you and give you grace. May the countenance of God be upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.